Okay, so we'll get started. Um, welcome to ThoughtWorks Talks Tech. Uh, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, my name's Cam Jackson, and tonight I'm going to be talking to you about micro front ends um, and specifically how they can help you scale your, your front end development process. Um, so, a little bit about me um, I'm a senior consultant here with ThoughtWorks, um, and I'm a full stack developer. So I've worked um, all over the stack, worked on front-end stuff, back-end infrastructure. Um, but the work that I'm uh, proudest of is helping large organizations to scale their front-end um, development processes and to do, um, to do front-end development really well. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick poll of the room just to get a sense of where everyone's at with, um, with front-end sort of stuff in general. So I'll give you three options. So um, if you could just put your hand up if front end's totally not your thing, you don't really know anything about it at all, and this is all pretty new to you. Cool, we've got at least one honest person. <laughs> um, so number two, uh, you know a little bit about front end, but you know it's not really your, your strong suit, but you can do it. Cool, and front end is your main thing, you're really good at it, or you're an expert and you really love doing front end development. <laughs> you're either really good at it or you love it. You don't have to be both. Maybe you do it, but you hate it. <laughs> Each finding your job. Okay, cool. Um, so we've got a big spread all across... Um, so that doesn't really help me. It'd be better if you either all were really good or all were really bad, but you're everywhere, so um, that's okay. I'll figure it out. So, right, uh, here's the obvious analogy. So microservices, um, you know, a lot has been written about microservices and people talk a lot about the various kind of advantages and, and disadvantages and trade-offs that we have um, with microservices. Um, so there is obviously an analogy here to, to micro front ends, otherwise we wouldn't, have, we wouldn't be using that name. Um, but the most relevant thing here, the most relevant um, comparison that we can make is we're talking about taking something which is really large and, and scary and nobody really wants to work on this thing anymore um, and breaking it down into smaller pieces which, um, which can be worked on um, independently by, um, by autonomous teams. That's kind of the main, the main significance here, or the main comparison that we're drawing between microservices and, and micro front ends. Um, so I said before, a lot has been written about microservices. Um, on an order of about 4,000 4, times as much um, comes up in Google if you look for microservices versus micro front ends. So I think I need to give this talk a few more times. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, so a lot of attention has, has been paid towards trying to improve um, our back-end code using, using microservices, but I think a lot of organizations are, are still building large kind of monolithic um, front-end projects, which they are struggling with. Um, but there are more and more organizations who want to, to try to split these up, um, especially with um, organizations realizing that a high-quality user experience can really be a differentiator for, for their product and for their company, um, front-end projects are getting more complicated, they are getting larger, and so we need better ways to actually manage these things and maintain them, um, especially over time. So let's jump right into an example. Um, this is an application that I worked on uh, well, about two or three years ago now. Um, 2015 and 2016 is when I worked on this. Um, for any accountants or former accountants in the room, this is a profit and loss report. Um, and it's just one of, the, one of the reports which you might have in, in accounting software. now. This profit and loss report is a, is a full um, and complete application. Um, it, it functions totally on its own. Um, it has its own set of dependencies. It has its own automated test suite. It had its own um, build process, its own deployment pipeline. And if you knew an obscure URL and you were a customer of, of this product, you could log in and you could actually see this profit and loss report like this in production. In practice, however, what people really saw was this. So I said before that a profit and loss report is only one part of what would be called to, uh, to an accounting um, software suite. Um, so you can see up here, maybe you can't see it, but in the navigation bar right at the top, this little button here which says reports is, is highlighted ever so slightly uh, because that's the section of the application that we're looking at. Um, so this profit and loss report was the micro front end, one of the micro front ends that I worked on, um, but it's just one part of a larger application. So MYOB Essentials, for any Aussies or Kiwis in the room, you might be familiar with MYOB. Um, this was uh, one of their most popular products, um, and it was a, a great, big, huge monolith, which nobody really wanted to touch. Um, it had been around for, for quite a while, and they were, and they were struggling with working on it. And that, all of what I just said was true of both the front end and the back end. So what they were doing was gradually trying to decompose this thing 
you know, they wanted to, to make the, the profit and loss report that was existing in the product a little bit nicer, work a little bit better. Um, and so they decided, well, rather than just work on the existing one, maybe we can rewrite it and we can do all of that work outside of the monolith. So rather than continuing to work on the monolith and to extend it and make it more complex, instead we're going to do our development work outside of it. And again, all of that was true for both the front end and the back end. I think um, a lot of organizations are doing this kind of work for their back end, but not as many people are doing it on the front end. So basically the way that it works is the easiest way to do it is to just look at each of the pages or, or sections or views in your application and just assign a team to it and say, you now, you own that, that feature. Um, and the, the most significant thing here is to, is to really focus your teams around business <coughs> capabilities. So for example, you might have a, a dashboard team or a sales team or a reporting team, which is the team that I was part of. Um, so they're, they're really oriented around features in the application rather than having, say, a forms team or a validation team or, or a styling team. Um, and so the reason we do that is that we can then have a team who owns that entire feature from the very start of the development process, from, from the analysis and the ideation, all the way through uh, development and testing and deploying it, and then the ongoing maintenance of that product as well. So that team owns it from beginning to end, from the top to bottom of the tech stack, from the, the front end all the way to the back end, um, and the infrastructure as well. Um, so that, that actually gives you, that can be a really powerful concept because you now have a fully autonomous team. We were able to work on this profit and loss report totally independently of anybody else in the company for the most part um, and deliver value to production without having to coordinate with a lot of other teams. So we do have a, essentially a parent-child um, relationship here. So a little bit of terminology. Um, the profit and loss report application itself, that was our micro front end. Um, and then the overall, on the outside, there's kind of this... Um, I've heard it called a few different things, a wrapper application or a shell or, or the parent app. And that's kind of the bit that sits on the outside and owns a lot of those cross-cutting concerns and pulls all of the micro front ends together um, into a, a single cohesive um, product. So we do have a, a parent-child relationship here. Um, and as with any complex system, especially when we're talking about multiple teams, the hardest part of this tends to be um, integration. So... Um, ironically, microservices tend to be difficult to integrate because there's a big network barrier between them. And how do you cross that network barrier? Do you use REST? Do you use um, an, an HTTP? Or do you use some sort of event queue? Like getting the integration right is one of the more difficult things to do well. Um, mm -hmm. Now, ironically, micro front ends, the integration is also difficult, but not because they're separate. It's actually difficult because everything is sitting on top of each other in a single browser and a single page. And you need to make sure that, you know, one micro front end doesn't cause one of the other ones on the same page to, to fail. Um, so that, that's where the integration becomes a little bit difficult. Um, so the, the parent uh, and the child and also the children on the same page um, all need to cooperate. So let's go through a little bit of how we can actually make it happen. So firstly, let's talk about um, how we actually integrate these things and how we actually pull them together. So you might be tempted, um, and again, I've worked on projects that have done this before, um, for anyone who's worked on sort of modern um, JavaScript projects, this would be an example of a, a package.json file. Um, if you're a Java person, this might this is sort of like your, your pom.xml if you're using Maven. Um, so what we're, what we're looking at here is, um, is we're, we're building an application called My Awesome App, um, and we've got some dependencies. And the dependencies that we're building in here are the dashboard, maybe the, the profile page, um, and the reports page. So you might be tempted to, what we're doing here is we're basically publishing our micro front ends as libraries or node modules, and we're pulling them in at build time and compiling them all into a single application, which we then deploy. Um, now, my general recommendation would be not to do this. Um, <laughs> so uh, the reason is it, it highly couples your, your deployment and your release cycles. So again, I've worked on a product that, that works this way. Um, and the problem is every time we wanted to deploy or release a new version of one of the micro front ends, everything basically funnels through that one team that owns the, the parent or the wrapper application. And um, on the product that I worked on, what that meant is that the team who are managing that application basically became a release management team because constantly all they were doing was fielding requests from other teams saying, hey, can you bump this version? Can you bump that version? Can you integrate my changes for me, please? Um, and I definitely wouldn't have wanted to work on, work on that team because that's a... That's a pretty boring job for them to do when they had their own backlog of features which they needed to be working on. Um, so, yeah, this really sort of tightly coupled um, the teams and didn't get a lot of those benefits that I was talking before about teams being able to work on things independently. Um, 
So this is a tweet from a couple of years back. Um, if your microservices or micro frontends, I would say, um, need to be deployed as a complete set in a specific order, then save yourself some pain and just put them back in a monolith. Um, and I think that's really true. That, that previous product that I worked on, all the pain that we were getting from trying to integrate these things and, and deploy them as a single, uh, a single set, it probably would have been easier if we just had them all, um, all back in a monolith. That would have made our lives easier. Right, so instead of integrating things at build time and compiling things into a single application, uh, we can integrate things dynamically in the browser at runtime. Um, so what we're looking at here is just an HTML document. Um, again, it's my awesome app. That's what we're still working on. Um, and our first script tag uh, just pulls in the, the bundle, um, bundled up compiled uh, JS file, which is for the general kind of top level of the application. Uh, maybe that's got a, our routing or our navigation or our, or our login sort of stuff. Um, and then underneath that, we put a container on the page. Um, really, there should probably be three different containers there. And each one of those containers would be for the various micro front ends that we're pulling in. So the awesome dashboard um, that we pull in knows that it renders itself into a particular div. It knows that that's its home on the page, and that's where it lives. Um, and by doing this, we're basically dynamically pulling in our code at runtime and, and joining these things in, into a single application. Now, the cool thing about this is um, I've shared these things here as, as though they're all being deployed in exactly the same place, but really these URLs could be going to all various different servers. And each one of those servers could be being managed and maintained by a different team working on their micro front end. So the team who works on the dashboard, they can push a new version of uh, awesome dashboard.bundle.js. They can push that out to production without needing to talk to the team who manages this HTML file. And so then if you go in and refresh your browser, subject to caching, of course, the new dashboard um, will come in and and it will be there live in production without having to talk to anyone else. Another way you can do this, and this is common, um, is you can use iframes. Um, iframes are not my, my favorite approach, but they do work. Um, they are a valid alternative. Um, the big advantage that you get with iframes is it gets you, it makes it a lot easier to have good isolation between in your micro front ends. Um, so with this approach, you don't really need to worry as much about the styles of one micro front end stepping on the, on the toes of another micro front end. Um, it is less, less flexible and it doesn't allow you to do certain things like um, managing the, having more close integration so you can manage the history and the navigation and, and deep linking and that sort of thing between your micro front ends. Um, and it also makes it more difficult for them to, communi to communicate with each other, for the parent to communicate with the child or for the children to communicate with each other. I'll talk more about the communication bit a little bit later. Um, so yeah, I guess with, with iframes, the, the advantage is that they're much more isolated, but the disadvantage is that they're much more isolated. Now, when I was talking about this concept to a, a developer much more experienced than me, um, he said, this is not new, you're not as cool as you think you are. We've been doing this for years. We used to do it back in 2002 with good old server-side includes in Apache. And of course he was totally right. You don't need to be doing any kind of fancy um, in the browser dynamic integration to make this work. You could just have, this is just a, a template file being rendered on the server and pulling in our various, um, our various micro front ends um, and just gluing them onto the page. So this, this is, I would still call this, this micro front ends. And he actually asked me, well, I can do this using this way, would you still call that micro front ends? And I said, yes. And the reason is you can still work on these three things independently and have the, have the teams who maintain them work autonomously with each other and deliver value to production without needing to coordinate. Um, but this is a little bit more limiting. It doesn't allow you to, for example, dynamically pull in um, different parts of the application depending on what the user is doing. Um, and you can't load new content client side um, without a full page reload. Um, so it's not as flexible, but again, this, this is a, a totally valid way to do it. Okay, so let's talk about some of those cross-cutting concerns that I mentioned earlier. So authentication. Um, this one actually isn't that difficult to deal with usually. Um, so kind of the go-to way that I've used in the past tends to be that parent application or the, the wrapper. Um, it would usually be the one that owns the authentication for the app and the authorization because um, it's, it's like I said, it's a cross-cutting concern. Everyone probably needs this. Everybody needs the user to be logged in. And it doesn't really make sense for everyone to, to, to build their own login page. It certainly doesn't make sense for the user to have to log in separately to each page in the application. Um, so for example, the way it might work is when you load the index of the app, um, it's going to give you a login screen. Uh, and when you put in your username and password or however your, your auth works, you're probably going to get back some sort of um, cookie or, or token or something like that. Again, this is just how auth, uh, auth usually works. Um, and then you just stick that, that, um, that token into your cookies and that will be valid for the entire site, the entire domain. So 
if you are then loading your micro front ends to work sitting on the same page in the same domain, they have access to that cookie and they can just send it with any requests they make to the server. So by logging into the parent application, you effectively become logged in for all of the micro front ends which are part of that parent application. So the micro front ends basically get their, their auth for free, so that's kind of cool. Um, the one disadvantage there is I, I, I've mentioned a couple of times that it should be a fully featured self-contained application. Um, with that approach, um, the, the micro front end is really relying on the parent being there to log you in. So, you know, as a fallback, maybe the micro front end can be logged into independently, but usually the way it would work is it just inherits um, the, the auth from the parent app. Okay, while we're talking about communications with the server, um, I shamelessly saw this from Sam Newman, who wrote a, a great book on, on building microservices. Um, and this isn't part of that book, this is, this is a different thing. And he talks about a, an architectural pattern called BFF. Uh, who knows what BFF stands for? Can someone tell me? Yeah. Back end for front end. Does anyone have a different thing that BFF stands for? Best friends forever, yeah. <laughs> so this, I love the dual meaning of this. So if you're not familiar with it, um, BFF is backends for front ends. So basically what we're saying is um, each front end gets its own back end. And the sole purpose, the sole reason for existing mm -hmm. of that back end is to serve the needs of the front end. So it serves mm -hmm. up you know, any data that it might need, it handles, handles requests that it makes. But it does have a double meaning because that back end and that front end, they are best friends forever. So that, that's kind of nice. That makes me feel warm and fuzzy. <laughs> um, so when, when Sam wrote about the BFF, I think um, the main sort of thing that he was envisaging is when he talks about different front ends, he's talking about uh, a mobile, a native mobile client front end, maybe a web client front end, and they may have quite different requirements. So it might make sense for each one to get its own back end, which just serves the requirements um, of that front end. And, you know, behind the scenes, they're probably getting their data from the same downstream services, but they can present a nice little facade, which makes sense for that front end. But I would take this a step further, and I would say, especially on the web, if each one of those colored boxes there represents a micro front end, maybe each one of those micro front ends can get its <coughs> own back end. Now, again, you don't have to do things this way, and I've worked on projects that have, had, that have had either way. Maybe there's an API which serves all of the data for the whole page, or maybe you have APIs which serve just the data for each individual micro front end. But I do like doing it the latter way, having a, a separate um, BFF for each micro front end, because again, it gets you really good autonomy of your delivery teams. So if I'm working on the, on the front end for just that profit and loss report, and we've built a, a back end server which serves just the profit and loss data, and that's the API, I can evolve these things like together and I own all of that and I can work on it without having to go and make sure that somebody else working on the shared backend doesn't have you know, their own changes which are conflicting with my changes. <clears throat> the other interesting question here is about service discovery. Um, and the question is, do you have um, each micro front end, if it has its own backend, know where that backend is? Does it know the URL that it makes its requests to, like the full, the full server path? Um, or does it get told by the parent? And again, you can kind of go either way here. Um, I like having each micro front end know exactly where its server is because it gives it really good independence. It can be deployed on its own. It doesn't rely on somebody else to tell it what to do. But at the same time, there's something to be said for that dependency injection of having the parent app um, be able to tell each front end um, where it might get its data from. So either of those ways can work. Okay, let's talk about style. Um, so with your micro front ends, um, not only does your product have to look good, um, but ideally you want it to be consistent because probably the only thing worse than socks and sandals would be one sock and one sandal with one converse. Um, so we want to have a consistent look and feel across our whole product. Yeah. Um, and I would say this is probably one of, one of the hardest bits to do well with this architecture because CSS is inherently um, global, inheriting, cascading, historically has had no module system variables or namespace or really any encapsulation of any kind. So if we're going to say that, um, you know, this part of the page has its style sheet and this part of the page has a different style sheet, and if they're built by two different teams, how do you make sure that they're not going to totally clobber each other? So this is hard to do well. So some of those features for CSS do exist now, um, and they, they are coming, but, but, you know, browser support is not always there, um, and polyfilling CSS is, is a little bit more difficult than polyfilling, say, JavaScript APIs. Um, so I would say if we're going for an architecture like a micro front end kind of architecture, we really do need a layer on top of CSS, which gives us, um, you know, some, some nice abstractions or especially encapsulation. So let's talk about a few options. SAS, SAS is okay. Um, it's not my favorite, um, but, you know, it's very popular. A lot of people know SAS. A lot of um, organizations have existing SAS code bases that they're using. 
Um, specifically, the feature that we might be talking about with SAS here would be the way we can use its nesting in order to give us some sort of encapsulation. Um, so if on our page um, we've got a div, which is where our profit and loss report lives, um, we can build a select like this. We can select that div using its ID. And then anything which we say inside here, selecting for H2 or table, what it ends up with is it doesn't select all the H2s or all the tables on the page. It only selects the ones which are inside that profit and loss report div. So this is a fairly basic way that we can get some encapsulation of our selectors so that I know that when I write some CSS over here to try to style um, the table, I'm not styling some other team's table and they're not going to come and yell at me and say, what the hell did you do to my table? Um, the reason I say SAS is not my favorite is because um, some, of its, some of its features, while very powerful, can be quite easy to abuse. It's easy to end up with very complex SAS code bases which are kind of difficult to reason about. Um, it also has some nasty native dependencies, which in my experience make it difficult to set up in development environments. So that's a bit of a deal breaker for me, but if you're already using SAS, this is a, this is a handy feature for, for microfinance. So something a little bit better, in my opinion, would be um, CSS modules. Um, I think that's a perfect logo for anything CSS related. <laughs> um, so CSS modules, again, um, the thing that we're after here is some sort of encapsulation over, over our selectors. And the way that this would work is, for example, I just write a normal star sheet, which maybe selects um, everything on the page which has the class called container. Um, but then there's basically a compilation step which transforms just plain old container into something which has been namespaced. So it's got a prefix at the front. Um, and the way that this then works is we actually load our style sheet from a JavaScript module. So um, there's a little bit of a React example here. If you're not familiar with React, don't worry about it. But basically what we're doing here is we import our styles module, which is actually a CSS file, but we're going to pretend that it's a JavaScript module. And what we actually get is that styles thing that we've imported becomes an object. And if we look at the dot container property, which is here, this is our, our dot container property, what it actually resolves to is a string, which is this namespace property here. So by pulling in our style sheet like that, we can just automatically get all of our, um, our namespace selectors, and then we can apply them into the DOM. So we can just add it to the class list of the element, or if we're rendering a React component, we can set it as the class name on our component. Now, the final way that I'll talk about is if we're talking about doing some of our styling um, in inside a JavaScript module, we can take that a little bit further and actually define the CSS directly in JavaScript. So instead of writing a CSS file and writing a CSS module, we can actually just put the, the styling code directly in our JavaScript module. So for example, um, using inline styles, and again, this is, uh, this is JSX. This is not valid JavaScript unless you have a compiler which is transforming it for you. Um, but just go with it if you haven't seen React before. Basically, we're defining a container component here, which accepts some children, which are going to go inside this container. And it's a div, and we apply some styling to the div, um, and it's got the margin top. Um, now, if you haven't seen this before, you know, for, for many, many years, people were saying, please keep your JavaScript and your HTML and your CSS separate. We're kind of doing the opposite of that here. Um, that's a separate talk. <laughs> um, but the nice thing about this is that it gives us really good encapsulation of our styles because that margin top which we've defined, there's no possible way that can ever go and end up somewhere that we didn't expect it to go because we've only applied it to this div or we've only applied it to this, this component, which is our container component. Um, so that's kind of the key thing here. When we're talking about trying to reuse the same style multiple places on, on the page, for example, our, our margin top, which we want on all of our container elements, rather than defining a class which we share across the page, we want to define a component which we share across the page. Now, this is getting a little bit away from micro front ends, but the reason I'm talking about this is because that model of sharing components tends to work quite well with a kind of a micro front architecture. Um, I've thrown this example in here as, as a further one. Um, if you are doing CSS in, in JavaScript, just as an aside, um, inline styles are, are nice. Um, style of components is even nicer. So if you're working in a React landscape and you want to explore doing your CSS in JavaScript, go and check out style of components. Um, it's a pretty cool library. So the, the takeaway from this is don't try to reuse styles or CSS or classes. Try to reuse components because they, they work better for this kind of architecture. So I have been talking a little bit about React. This is the first time I've gone into specific libraries or frameworks. Um, React definitely does not have a monopoly over the micro front end space. Really, there's nothing stopping you from using whatever framework you like, as long as that framework can, made, can be made to behave and say, you live in this one spot on the page and don't go doing stuff with the entire page. So React is quite good at, at just being told, you render yourself into this div, and this is where you live, and you do all the stuff inside that div, 
And there might be other things on the page going on which it doesn't need to know about. React does that well. Um, so if you're using a, a different framework, whether it's Ember or Angular or whatever, um, you can have a look and see whether your framework will behave nicely and, and will just will just sit in one place on the page. I would say that a library which has a strong component model like, like React does, um, does tend to work well um, with this architecture, um, especially when it comes to code reuse and reusing those components like I was talking about a minute ago. Um, but actually, one of the benefits that you can get with micro front ends is it does give you a bit of flexibility to have um, some diversity in your tech stack. If you want to have React rendering part of the page and you want to have something else rendering a different part of the page, you can do that. I wouldn't recommend trying to collect every single framework on one page. That's probably not, not a great approach. But hey, if you really want to, I'm not going to judge you. Um, but one thing that this is really useful for is um, the example that I, that I spoke about earlier, the real app that I worked on, the, the accounting app. That was a Backbone JS application. And we started using React to build the various micro front ends which would sit inside it. And so those frameworks, they were perfectly happy to sit on the same page together. And it gives you an opportunity to experiment, try a different framework, move from something old like Backbone, which you don't want to use anymore, and gradually start moving to something like React, which is maybe what you want to be using. So it does give you a bit of, a bit of flexibility because you're not building one single application which all has to be the same framework. You can build multiple applications and use whatever framework makes sense. <laughs> That's a good question. The question there is about a parent and a child using different versions of React. Um, that is actually, believe it or not, one of the frequently asked questions which I have at the end of this this, um, this presentation. So I'll get to that. Um, okay, cool. So I mentioned a little bit before about this code reuse and reusing components. Um, this, in general, is a good idea. Um, so one thing that people often want to do is pull out common components. Um, and put them into a library so, they, so that they can be used across various different micro front ends. So if we've got a, a button, for example, or any of the things that we've got here, um, we might want to reuse that button across our different micro front ends. This has two main benefits. One is it gives you really good consistency. If everyone's using the same button component, all your buttons are going to look the same. You don't end up with all different ones in different parts of the app. And secondly, that code reuse makes things a little bit easier. If I come on and I start a new project, I don't have to build a button. I just use the button which already exists, and I can go about my day and do something more interesting than building a button. Uh, this can also become a living style guide, and that's pretty cool. Um, so rather than having a, a great big long document which lists these are all the colors that we use, these are the, this is what our buttons should look like, <clears throat> these are our styles, you actually just encode that. You actually write that in code, and that defines um, this is what our style is. Um, and if I'm a developer and I come along and I need to make uh, a new feature look like the company's style guide, I don't have to look at the style guide and then figure out how to translate that into code. I just use the components that somebody else has written and it automatically kind of fits with the, with the style guide that exists. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, this is not limited to just boring things like um, buttons or, or labels or, or forms, for example. Um, you can also use this to build more complex things like layout components. Um, so the bootstrap responsive grid is something which is out there and tons of people use the bootstrap responsive grid to lay out their page. You could, and again, I would say um, that that works well, but rather than trying to reuse classes and reuse styling, let's try to reuse components. So we can have components which say it takes up two columns out of the 12 or, or whatever it is. Um, and that becomes a, a nice way to build our applications. Um, and feel free, if you're building one of these libraries, feel free to have you know, fancy logic in there. For example, if I'm building a, an auto-suggesting, auto-completing, searching drop-down box, that's going to be quite complicated. Or a day picker is another example of something which is quite complicated, and there's going to be quite a lot of logic in there. Feel free to have that logic live inside your component library. But what you want to be careful of is don't put business logic in there. So it's okay to build a, an auto-completing um, drop-down search box, but don't make it a, an auto-completing customer drop-down search box or product drop-down search box, right? Because you're starting to put your domain or business logic into something which is a shared library. And that often ends up going badly because now I can't change the business logic without breaking other people, um, other people's applications. So, so stick to, to UI logic rather than business logic in here. Okay, let's talk about testing. Um, so how do we test these micro front ends? Now, the cool thing about this is each micro front end, as I've said before, is pretty much a self-contained um, application which exists in its own right. So whatever would be good practices on any front end application, we can apply those same practices to each individual micro front end. So each micro front end should have its own comprehensive test suite, and we should use all the same rules that we usually use for automated testing. So we want to focus 
Uh, we've got that, that test pyramid, which you might be familiar with, but we want to focus uh, mostly on unit tests, right? Lots of unit tests on the functionality, and then move up and do some sort of application level integration tests, and then some functional or end-to-end -end testing on the top. Um, so essentially, not a whole lot changes here. However you would test your application normally, use that same testing strategy on each of your micro front ends. And if it's been working well for you in the past, it should work just as well in a micro front end architecture. Now, one of the common questions that comes up here is, what about integration testing of the entire application? I want to have in an automated fashion some really good confidence that all of my micro front ends are going to come together nicely, compose together on the page, and actually work as a single application. And um, that's a great question. Um, I would draw the same analogy here to microservices. So when it comes to microservices, yes, you want to make sure that all of your various services integrate uh, together correctly and do actually function. But you don't want to go too far with it. Um, I'm sure a lot of us have probably worked on these kind of really um, large, largely scoped kind of integration or functional end-to-end -end test suites, which cover a lot of different systems. And they tend to be a massive pain to maintain. They tend to take a long time to, to write new tests. They tend to be difficult. They tend to be quite flaky and just randomly break for no kind of logical reason. Um, so don't, I would say don't spend too much time trying to build that, that integration level of testing across the whole app. It's definitely worth doing. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't do it. But focus on only the things that you can't test at a lower level. So don't go and try and test all of the various features of all of the micro front ends at that, at that top level using a functional end-to-end um, -end test suite. Instead, just focus on the bits that you haven't tested elsewhere. So for example, if there is some integration, if there's some data which goes from the, from the parent down to one of the child apps, maybe just make sure that yes, that data has successfully gone from the parent to the child and I can see it rendered on the page. Or maybe you even go even simpler than that. All you do is try to load the URL where the whole application is located and just make sure that, yeah, the title of that is there. So I, literally, I just look for a string that says dashboard. And if I see it, I know that my dashboard micro front end has successfully rendered itself onto the page. And maybe that's as far as you go. Um, if you don't have a whole lot of integration between the two, you're just trying to make sure that it has actually rendered on the page. And everything else you can test it at a lower level. Right, so I'm talking about cross-component communication here. Um, and I would probably say that second to styling, this is the next most difficult thing to do well. Um, so as a general rule, don't, <laughs> if you don't have to. Um, communication between the, the micro front ends um, tends to couple them together. And it tends to mean that I can't change mine without worrying about how that's going to affect a, a different one on the page. Um, similarly, even between the parent and the child, the more chatty they are, the more communication that goes on between the two, the more difficult it becomes to evolve them independently of each other. So to take one example, that profit and loss report that I showed earlier, uh, if you were looking really closely, it had the company's name on the report. There was a different page in the application, the profile page, where you could edit the company name and save it. So what we could have done would be to have, when you edit it on the profile page, that somehow instantly propagates across to the reporting page and updates what would be shown on the screen. But we didn't want to link these two together. So instead, what we did is we just go via the server. So on the profile page, you update your company's name. That gets saved into the database. And then when the user navigates to the reporting page, we would always go and fetch new, fresh data from the server so that we could guarantee if you'd just got an update of your company name, uh, we would have that latest data pulled down from the server. So going via the server is one way that you can, um, you can avoid having your micro front ends talk directly to each other. Now, of course, that only works um, if you've got two different views or two different pages. If you've got two micro front ends right side by side on the same page and you want to change one thing over here and have that show up over here, that's a little bit more challenging. Um, the first thing I would say is if there is a lot of communication going on between the two, maybe it should just be one micro front end. Maybe trying to draw a big line between the two of them, you're actually just making your life more difficult and you should just merge them. Um, but if you do decide that it's a, it's a good idea to have the two separate and have some communication between the two, fine. But think carefully about how you do it. Try to define some sort of protocol, whether it's a, a message format that they send between the two, and actually think about what that contract is. Because it is a contract. And once you define it, you need to make sure that it's stable. You need to make sure that the two sides adhere to that contract and they, and they both respect it. Okay, cool. So we're almost there. Let's go through a couple of frequently asked questions. Um, of course, People want to, want to ask, how micro should they be? And the answer is, it really doesn't matter. Um, and again, I think I see the same answer given to how micro should your, should your microservices be. Um, really, there's no, I'm certainly not going to give a, a line of code metric or anything like that. Um, 
you just need to figure out what works for you. Um, so I would say, if you're dealing with the pain of a large monolith, um, make it smaller than your monolith. So make it small enough that you don't have that massive amount of complexity and coupling that can come with a, a large monolithic code base. So it's smaller than that. But don't make them so small that they don't make sense. If you can't define a solid business functionality reason for that micro front end to exist, then maybe you've gone too fine grained you've gone too small. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no single answer to this. Uh, and the other frequently asked question, question which, I'll, um, which I'll answer is, what about download sizes? So this is not directly your question, but it does relate to it. Um, so if you have five different micro front ends um, on the page, and they all use React, and they all use the same version of React, um, we're probably wasting a lot of bytes going over the wire here, because if it's got lots of different micro front ends and they all have the same version of React embedded inside that, that compiled JavaScript file, we're forcing our users to download React five times, right? Now, React is not that big, but you, know, you are wasting bytes. Um, and especially if we're talking about mobile, for example, you know, every byte kind of counts. You know, there's been studies that um, if your site takes more than four seconds to load, like, I don't know, a quarter of your users just go, no, it's too hard. Like, people are really impatient. Um, and especially if we want to think about people who uh, are in, um, you know, developing countries and countries that don't have um, internet connections that are quite as fast as what we're used to in Singapore, and we should care about those people and we should make sure that they get a high-quality user experience as well, then we really need to think about how we solve some of these problems. So this is not easy to do. Um, but if you're using something like Webpack, for example, and some of the more modern build tools, they do have options that allow you to say, yes, I want you to compile all of my dependencies into that bundle.js, but not this one. So maybe if you know, we've got a whole bunch of different microservices and they all use the same version of React, maybe they don't compile React into their bundle. And instead, the parent application can embed React on the page for them. And then when they show up, they just assume that that library is going to be there for them so that they can do their thing. Now the complexity comes if you have two micro front ends that want to use different versions of React, right? Um, that starts to get a little bit more difficult. Um, now, if they are bundled up and included inside your bundle, it does work, and I've done this before, that this team can be using, using React 15 and this team can use React 16, and they will actually coexist on the same page together and just do their thing in their individual divs. But if we're going to try and um, share our dependencies so that we can reduce our download sizes, you make that a lot more difficult. Um, if you do want to upgrade, well, upgrading a shared dependency is really tricky. You've got two choices. You either say, okay, everybody needs to upgrade their, this, this major break and change at once, and we all need to release in lockstep. That's going to be really painful. Um, so you'd need to try to figure out some sort of way that we can have both 15 and 16 there on the page. Maybe the parent application supplies the default version or the latest version, um, and anybody who wants an older version, they can bring along their old, their old version. Um, these things do work. They are tricky, and there are complexities and, and bugs that can come here from trying to have the same... Um, the same libraries multiple times on the page. Um, but in general, these things work. So there's no, there's no easy answer to this, but <laughs> solutions are there um, if, you, if you want to try them. Um, and yeah, that's all I have. <coughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. It's cool that CSS clashing with the parent from time to time. So the question here is about, <clears throat> for those who didn't hear it, is about, um, I mentioned ways to try to namespace the, the CSS into each micro front end so that one micro front end doesn't clash with another. But what if the parent defines its own styling? How do you stop the styling of a parent? Um, conflicting with the various um, child micro front ends. Um, yeah, there's no kind of easy way to solve that problem. Um, in general, I think if you're working on something new, I would generally say you just need to make sure that the parent only defines um, its, its CSS selectors to work on very specific parts of the page. Keep the, the parent or the wrapper as simple as possible so that, you know, it's pretty much just a navigation bar, for example. And so as long as nobody else has, um, you know, a div with an ID of nav or a nav element with an ID of nav, you should be safe. Where it becomes more difficult is, and where this, this architecture tends to be used most commonly, is if you're dealing with a large monolith which already exists and already has a huge CSS code base that comes with it. And you're going to try to put um, a micro front end inside of that, and you need to stop that huge CSS from, from clobbering all of your own styles. Um, yeah, there's not really an easy way to deal with that. <laughs> um, unfortunately, you kind of just have to 
accept that that stuff is there. A lot of the time it's not a huge problem because if the parent is defining, um, you know, uh, a color for the entire site because that's the, that's the brand's primary color, you probably want that color. Or if they're defining, you know, other things which are common to the page, a lot of it you want anyway, so it tends not to be a big problem. Um, but yeah, it did, it did bite us in the past where, you know, when we ran our application, Like this, it sorry, like this, it worked. But when we went and put it inside this thing, it, it did look slightly different. It was just a matter of mostly of testing those things, seeing how things looked, um, and then trying to adjust. Um, you could do other things like trying to look into um, like resetting all of the CSS properties. Um, so you can do things like that to try to set everything back to like a base standard and then style things after that. Um, so yeah. So what is this yeah, yeah, yeah. If you if you were trying to put the micro front end inside different applications and they were all going to bring a different star sheet, it would become a lot more complex then. And yeah, you'd probably have to look into doing some sort of reset so that you have a, a base to work from. Other questions? Yeah. Sorry, can you speak up a little bit? Yeah. So the question, if I've understood it correctly, is is about caching. So if I'm deploying a new version of the dashboard bundle without touching this file then I can't put a unique hash of the version of that bundle.js, which makes it more difficult to invalidate the cache. That, yeah. So um, uh, e-tags is probably the way that I've used to do that in the past. So you can use e-tags for, for, um, for the server to basically tell the client whether you've got the latest version or not. Um, that's what we used in the past. The, the parent application did just have a URL like that. Um, I mean, yeah, caching, caching is always difficult to get right, um, but... Yeah, I think the short answer is you can usually use e-tags to get around some of that. Um, or you can always manually invalidate the cache on the back end whenever you do a deployment of that bundle.js, whatever you're using for caching, many CDNs allow you to manually invalidate and say, um, serve, serve a new version of that file now. So that would be another approach. Yeah. To what degree have you thought about um, the applicability of this to apps and how it can be applied to apps, in particular as we see more OTA being available? You're talking about like native mobile apps? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the, the question is about um, how, how we could use this sort of pattern for, for native apps. Um, it's not something I've done personally before. Um, I, in fact, I've never worked on, on native mobile apps before. So I probably can't um, rely on a whole lot of um, experience to, to talk about this. But um, certainly if you're using um, something like React Native, um, you could probably use it to, to dynamically glue some of these things together. Um, I know uh, in the past, Apple has had a lot of restrictions on pulling um, pulling code over the network and, and running it on the client, but I hear they've been okay with that for React Native. So if you are using React Native, you could probably, um, you could probably explore using this. Um, for other kind of native code, um, I'm not sure. You could, you, you could probably do it, but you might be limited to, to this kind of approach, um, like building different pages of the app um, independently and then compiling them into a single app at build time, you could probably make that work. But again, if you're gonna do that, you then have to be wary of the fact that if I wanna publish a new, um, a new part of one part of the app, I need to publish a new version of the entire app. So um, yeah, I'm not really sure how that could work, but it's a really good question. <coughs> it's worth exploring, especially yeah. as Apple has become looser on OTA. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the way someone there described it to me is, yes, you can't turn your, first, your, your camera app into a first person yeah. shooter, yeah. but if you want to extend your camera app, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you probably could. I, I've never done it, but I would love to hear from anyone who has. Any other questions? When the buttons, can be directly the server or do you need to proxy the panel? For loading the, the front ends? Yeah. Um, so the question is about um, loading these directly from a server or going through some proxy. Um, again, I've used both. I don't think it really matters. Um, either approach can work. Um, the benefit of using a proxy is you can have um, all of the requests going through a single place. It means you don't need to worry about things like a cause, for example. If everybody just makes their requests to a relative URL of slash whatever, and maybe it's like slash like my 
my BFF name and then whatever the route is. Um, that's one thing that, that I've done in the past. Um, that means you don't have to worry about cores. It simplifies some of that. But um, again, it then means that that proxy becomes a piece of shared infrastructure which needs to be like, managed across all of the different teams. So, so it becomes a, an extra point of coupling. Um, so having the, having the server URL directly in there and each thing knows exactly um, where to go or, or where to load these from, um, that can get rid of some of that coupling. So but either approach works perfectly fine. Yeah. So let's say I have to only have, uh, we have yeah, three members. Mm -hmm. Do I need to say it's necessary for us to, uh, to apply this uh, micro front? Yep. So the question, as I understand it, is about whether it's worth using micro front ends for a team of, say, three people. Um, I would say there's probably less benefit. Um, where I've seen this work um, the most and where I've seen this have the biggest impact is when you have a large organization and you have several different teams and you want those teams to be able to work independently of each other. Um, but I think the same thing applies to microservices. Um, I think having a, a single team with lots and lots of microservices um, probably introduces more overhead than just having um, having something which is a little bit more consolidated. Um, again, like if you have a large product and you're scared of how big this monolith might become and how complex it's going to become, yeah, sure, split it into into micro finance to get some of that advantage of. Um, I guess in that case, you're 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 chasing the advantage of reduced complexity and reduced coupling between the various parts of your application by drawing great big lines between them that say the dashboard is totally independent of the, of the profile page rather than having them couple into, into something which makes it more difficult to change. Um, but, so you're still going to get those benefits, but you know, there's other benefits there which you might not get, which is about independent teams. Um, so it might still be worth it, um, but it's probably less worth it than if you're working in a large organization. So how difficult, <laughs> I mean, this opens the question. Yeah, you start with the team of three, but what happens when that team becomes a team of 20 next yep. year? Yep. How difficult to migrate to this? Does yep. it make sense to? What's the cost of you know? Yep. God help us, future proofing. Yep. In this case, yep. Um, to, you know, to do that, and what frameworks might there be? Yep. To make that easier for someone. Yep. So I think prematurely adopting a, a complex architecture for the future is always obviously a dangerous road to go down because you can add more complexity than you than you take away, um, but. I think it's not difficult to at least leave the door open for this kind of architecture. So if you are starting as, as a team of three, you really just want to be wary of, um, especially CSS would be the main thing. You want, to be, you want to be wary of how well you can scope things and focus things so that if you do want to start adopting this kind of architecture in the future, it's fairly easy to just say, well, this thing lives in this div and it's not integrated with the rest of it. Um, so I think you actually touched on a really good point, which is that beginning to adopt this architecture from something which was previously a great big monolith is really easy. Um, and I've worked in a, a few organizations who have done this. They had something which was big and scary and no one wanted to touch it. And they literally just picked one feature. Um, some places even just picked like a single button and they said, we're going to experiment with React here. And this one button in the whole page, we're going to render that with React and everything else is going to stay the same, right? And that's how they started just to experiment and see if it would work. And when it did, they, then they said, okay, let's take a page. Let's take a whole page and we'll rewrite this page from our old thing, which we don't like, into our new thing. And it's actually really, really easy most of the time to, to get started with migrating from one architecture to the other. So I don't think it's a big thing that you need to worry about up front, um, but, but yeah, there are some, some small things that you can do to make that migration a little bit easier in the future if you've got that in mind. And styling would be probably the main thing just because CSS can be difficult to wrangle into something which is encapsulated when you're starting with something which is, uh, which is kind of all over the place. Yeah. So, um, uh, I understand the benefit of having each micro front end their own VM Yep. Uh, so, each team can own end to end, right? Um, yep. How do we avoid this VM having to be in logic? For example, like, we have a section of the page that, like, the, for example, the company for funding, there's some logic behind it, right? Yep. So, so that, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I think if you kind of look at, um, so the, the question for anyone who didn't hear it is about um, if we're going to define um, BFFs for different parts of the application, there might be some logic which you want to be the same across the, across the different BFFs. So I think the, <coughs> excuse me, the most straightforward answer to that question would be, would be downstream. Um, so, a lot of the times these BFFs become 
fairly simple gateways or, or pass-throughs. That's really just, I can make a single request um, to say, fetch me the data for this page. And the BFF here knows exactly what data that front end needs, and it's able to go and fetch that data and aggregate it from different places. Um, or if you're talking about a mutation, um, that request is coming in from the front end. And again, this thing might be a fairly simple pass through, and it knows what downstream service that data needs to, needs to be sent through. And that's where, that's where that common business logic lives so that we don't have to duplicate it across multiple different places. Um, so I think with the BFF pattern in, in general, um, it's a really good point. It does have benefits, but you definitely don't want to be you know, copying and pasting your entire kind of, um, kind of business logic across all these different BFFs. These should usually be fairly thin, um, and most of the code that's in here should be to do with the stuff that this thing needs. There was a question over here somewhere. Yeah. question I think is about um, having these micro front ends work well in responsive sites, especially because the, the parent application might have complex logic about how things should be laid out depending on the width of the page and the micro front ends need to work well in that kind of style, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, responsive stuff can be a little bit tricky. Um, I think in general, if we're looking at a page which looks like, actually, use, let's use a, a more visible example. Um, so this page that we worked on was not built to be responsive, so it's actually a bad example, but what we did do is we, we, we knew roughly the size that we would be contained in, right? So I guess this was, a, it was not an explicit contract, it was a bit more implicit, which was that we knew, um, we knew the size of the thing that we'd be in, right? And so knowing that, knowing that the parent was going to put us in a particular size box, we could make sure that we behaved nicely um, in, inside, that, that, inside that box. Um, I think in general, responsive design works well. You definitely want to have a view of what the entire application looks like at various different sizes. But I think there's also something to be said for kind of breaking that problem down and thinking about that problem individually for each part of the page. Um, so for example, this profit and loss report, we sh what we should have done was come up with exactly how this thing should look at a whole bunch of different resolutions. And, and what that actually looks like probably mostly doesn't really matter about what the rest of the page looks like. As long as each part of the page makes sure it looks good at a particular resolution, they're probably going to look well all together at that resolution. Uh, so maybe the look wise, yeah. then the later the CSS part still gets some trouble. So most of the master size will be defined. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I think again, that sort of comes back to the problem of um, in general, we don't want too much styling to be going on at the parent to be affecting what's going on inside the child. Um, and if you can find ways to namespace that CSS or reset the CSS within a micro front end so that it does have kind of ultimate control over what goes inside itself and it's not interfered with too much by the parent, that's probably a better place to be rather than letting the parent kind of reach in and, and do random stuff with the layout of all of the different micro front ends. Yeah. Okay, so this uh, this methodology, the third way rank, so does it uh, work fast with uh, client rendering or server? As we know, the fundamental difference between these two is that uh, the server determines your URL. Yep. Based on your URL, it determines the, what is the output HTML. Yep. But the client, uh, client rendering is like normally taken care of. If you are talking about React, right? Yep. It's, uh, it's based on the, uh, the mapping. Router. So, yep. how, how, how does this methodology work? So, you're talking about how this would work, um, the, the comparison of whether this works better for client rendering versus server rendering, and it should do with things like routing. So, um, I'll have to be a little bit speculative here because I haven't used this pattern with server <laughs> rendering. I've only used it for kind of single page apps with, with, with client rendering. Um, but I mean, there's, there's no reason why you can't. Where you can't use, I mean, this would be an example of some server rendering here where it's up to the server to, to glue the various, the various bits together. And maybe when the server is rendering this HTML template, 
based on the, the URL that was requested, it figures out which one of these things it should include on the page so that it can render um, so that the correct micro front end gets, gets rendered into the view. Um, so something like that would, would definitely work. Again, I've only used it for, um, used it with, with client side rendering. And like you hinted at again, the, the route, um, the URL of the page tends to become the, the biggest communication mechanism between the components. So I didn't talk too much about it before, but usually the URL is kind of the one source of truth that all of the different front ends are looking at. And based on what that URL is, I know that it's my turn to render myself and you know, it's not my turn to render myself based on the route that we're looking at. Um, and it can also become a bit of a, a communications mechanism as well. If you're sort of redirecting from one part to the other, you know, this, um, this micro front end might say, um, I'm going to navigate to a different URL and pass in some parameter in the URL. And that's where, um, you know, a different micro front end picks up from and, and takes that data in. So it can be a basic sort of communication mechanism between the two. And I think the same thing would work on the server as well if you're doing server rendering. So one micro front end might just do document dot location equals whatever in order to make the request go to a, a new location. The server figures out which micro front end should be rendered based on that URL. And you could pass in some metadata as well. And then the next micro front end picks up, picks up from there. Um, so I think it could work for both with a caveat that I haven't tried it. <laughs> <laughs> so I am going to stick around for a bit. So if anybody has any more questions, which they don't want to speak in front of everyone, I'm happy to take more questions. Um, I have been given a couple of things which I need to mention, otherwise I get in big trouble. Um, we do have a thing called Friends of ThoughtWorks, which you can see on the side over here. So you can stay up to date on what's happening at ThoughtWorks Singapore. So there's a QR code there, which you can scan if you'd like to become a, a friend of ThoughtWorks. Um, and of course, the other thing I have to mention is that we are hiring. Um, ThoughtWorks is a, is a pretty fantastic place to work. Everything which you've heard tonight, I learned while I've been working uh, as a consultant with ThoughtWorks. It's a really good place. I, I recommend it. So, um, you know, get in touch with, with me or reach out to, um, to one of our recruiters. Uh, I believe they are, they are around somewhere if you're interested in a job. Um, but thanks for coming, everyone.